As always, links to the source code and video transcript in the description. In the last video, I gave an introduction to finite state machines and the state pattern, but kept everything to pseudocode since the theory alone can be a lot to wrap your head around. In this video, we'll look at actually implementing a state machine in Godot. I'll go ahead and say that what I've done here is by no means the only or definitive way to implement a state machine in the engine, and I've seen a few different methods used and they all have pros and cons, but I do think that my method offers some nice conveniences and keeps the code base a bit cleaner, so I'm going to throw it out there as an option. The test project for today will be a basic platformer with a switch that the player can hold down to charge a light and make it blink faster. It's fairly simple, but it's enough to get the idea across. I'll first demonstrate the enumerator method, just so you have it as a reference, and then we'll look at the state pattern implemented in code. But I'm going to do things a little bit differently than how I showed it last week to take advantage of some Godot specific features, so let's dive in. So let's start out with an example of using enumerators to manage state. There's not a whole lot to say about this method, as it looks more or less exactly like it did in the last video, and there's nothing specific to Godot about its implementation. But for the sake of completeness, here's what the scene and code looks like from the sample project on our switch, which, as I mentioned previously, charges a blinking light when the player stands on it, making it blink faster the longer it's held down. The most important thing to note here is that I use a switch statement, or match in Godot's case, wherever there is logic dependent on the current state. This makes it easy to expand the code base over time and keeps things neater than using a bunch of if statements to figure out which state the object is in. The only other thing I'll point out is that I do a bit of cleanup at the top of my code by using an on ready var to store a reference to my child nodes. That way, if I move them around later or add some additional nodes I want to reference, as can often happen as the game grows, I only have to change the reference to them once. So with the enumerator method out of the way, let's take a look at implementing the state pattern properly now. As mentioned previously, I'm going to change the technique from what I showed you last week just a little bit now that I'm specifically designing my state machine for Godot. If you'll recall, the pseudocode for changing states within the active state returned a new instance of the desired state. And you could use this method with Godot, you would just need to have a reference available for each state class. This could be done using the class name keyword to throw it into the global namespace, which I've talked about in a previous video, and this would make the class available Available wherever you just want to reference it by name. You could also use a preload with a path to the script to keep it out of the namespace. Or you could also take this kind of same concept and use an exported variable so you can just drag and drop a reference to the script from within the editor. And I don't think any of these methods are too bad, but I think there's a better way we can do things in Godot. Rather than generate new state classes and delete ones every time we switch states, we could place each state into its own node and get a reference to it as needed, making use of the enter and exit functions to handle initialization and destruction logic similar to how you would if you were going to instantiate and destroy a class every time you change states. And in my opinion, this gives the best of both worlds of static and runtime generated states. Plus, it lets us make use of some Godot specific features. So kind of to sum it up, by using a node for each state, we get the following benefits. Each object gets its own pseudo static state, reducing data churn but maintaining reusability since the states aren't actually static and can be used on multiple objects. We can keep our code base cleaner and more loosely coupled by not polluting the global namespace or keeping a hard-coded reference to each script. And finally, we can use Godot editor features such as exported variables to make things easier to tweak and reuse as we go along. And so in addition to using nodes for each state, I'm also going to use an intermediary node to organize and handle communication to and from the states. That way the player script can stay fairly minimal. And so the player scene ends up looking like this. It's just a kinematic body 2D as the root node with an associated collision shape, an animated sprite, and then a state manager node that is the parent to the individual states. So let's take a look at how this all really works together now. Starting at a high level and working our way down, the player script is both clean and minimal. I just delegate to the state manager when I have state dependent logic to handle, such as with the physics process or unhandled input functions in this case. In the ready function, I go ahead and initialize the default state of the player and pass a reference of the player object to the states so they can do things like move the character around. And normally giving a child object access to the player like this would be a problematic design choice, but since the states are really just hot swappable brains for the player, I think it's okay. Though you could get around this by giving each state references to specific functions to call in the player's script. That way the player is still the ultimate authority on things, and it's not a bad idea to consider it for a production project. But I'm going to stick with the simpler implementation for this demonstration so we can focus on the state machine itself. Just keep in mind that you should always be considering the context of what you're doing and why so you can make those better, cleaner design choices as you're designing your project. 
And so let's move on to the state manager scene, which is just a node with child nodes for each state. The first thing you'll probably notice on this script is that I'm using an enumerator, state which is held within the base state class, to store a reference to each state in a dictionary. I prefer this method over using a string or something like that to reference states, i.e. change state, quote idle, as it is less prone to errors and provides a consistent interface wherever I need it. The downside is that Godot's typing system does not like null values to be returned on functions expecting an integer as the return value, meaning I have to return an enum value for null when I don't actually want to return anything. It's a bit annoying, but I still think it's better than using strings that can be prone to typo and changes in capitalization and so on. The rest of the code is extremely similar to what I showed last week for the player object, and so there's not a whole lot to say about it. This is really just a simple node to offload a bit of work from the player script and delegate to the active state. So let's look at the individual states now, where each state is based off the base state class, which provides a default implementation for each function that may get called by the state machine and creates the enumerator used to reference each state. It also stores a reference to the player and automatically changes the player's animation when the state is entered. And with animation name exported, we can also just use the editor for each state to type in the name of the animation that should be played when it enters. For an example of an implementation of the base state, we can first look at the idle state because it's the simplest implementation, as it just waits for the player to press a button or fall off the ground to change states. Since base state takes care of the default implementations of each function, we really just need to override the functions we care about. In this case, that's the input and physics process functions. We can make things a bit more interesting though with looking at the jump state. The jump state exports vars specific to its state so that they can be changed in the editor. It also has a custom enter function that applies an upward force to the player so that they can jump when entering the state, but it still calls the inherited enter function so that the animation is changed changed as well without having to rewrite the code. And that's what the dot enter function is doing. In the physics process function, we handle the physics simulation and change states as needed using a custom move speed variable just in case we want the player to move at a different speed while in the air. And this is exposed in the editor so it'll make it very easy to iterate on and tweak. And that's it for the code breakdown. I'm going to skip showing the walk and fall states as they're not really doing anything particularly interesting or different from the idle and jump states. But that should be enough to show you how the state pattern can be implemented in Godot. Altogether, it's a pretty slick design pattern that's handy to keep in mind when developing your games. If you're still uncertain about it, try downloading the source code for the sample project and tracing the flow of the logic in the program. You may also want to go back and review the theory video if you're uncertain why we did what we did. The theory behind the implementation is the same. I just take advantage of some of the features that Godot offers to give us an even more powerful system. Just remember that if you can draw a flowchart showing when each state should change and what it should change to, the state pattern could be a good fit for that situation. Until next time.